Um, so I have two more things. Is a little bit of history of the field. Um, it is a very Western view because that's what I know. But I did some uh, reading this morning and last night. Um, so I, I have to be very particular. This is not the history of neuroscience, nor is it the history of medicine. I specifically want to talk about neural engineering. Uh, I will say with some certainty that the oldest records I can find are actually from China uh, that go back to acupuncture. The oldest written records are from the Han Dynasty. That's about 200 years before, so about 2,000 years ago. Is that about right? Something like that. Um, and um, it, acupuncture is not exactly neural engineering. It's not using electricity or extracting it. But what it's probably doing, and again, this is debated uh, in the literature, what it's probably doing at a physiological level is when you insert the pin in specific regions, you're generating a neural reaction that goes all the way up centrally and induces opioid release. So remember I told you just a little few minutes ago about electroceuticals, that is electrically inducing uh, neuromodulation. In a sense, the thinking is that acupuncture is a form of this. It's not that the, the needles are electrical, but they're stimulating sensory neurons to come centrally to induce release in specific brain regions. And as you'll see, these high levels of connectivity um, may lead to opioid or pain-reducing neurotransmitters in the right regions of the brain. Um, there was a, <coughs> a little bit of um, history about where people s even started acupuncture. Uh, by the Han Dynasty, it was well-developed. Um, the preceding thing was they were suggesting that in wars, early Neolithic wars, I mean, this is 4,000 years ago, that soldiers with arrow wounds would not feel certain pain. And it was sort of slowly putting these pieces together that penetration in particular regions of sharp objects led to pain reduction. Um, it was, <laughs> I guess that's a big data problem in the days when the data wasn't very big. <laughs> but they sort of extracted this information from, from wounded soldiers. That's, that's my understanding. I, I imagine somebody in this room could find out more information than I could. Uh, using only English websites. That's all I had access to. So it's fascinating. So let's, let's for the moment, consider this to be neuromodulation, and I'll talk more about that. Because even there, it's not clear where that modulation is happening, okay? Um, from an electrical innovation standpoint, the earliest record I can find in Western literature goes back to the physician of the Emperor Claudius. That was about, um, also about 2,000 years ago, plus or minus. And this is the most bizarre treatment ever imagined. <clears throat> he took this thing called the torpedo fish, which is an electric fish, and it generates a very powerful electric shock, about 200 volts. And the cellular mechanism by which it can do that is a wonderful lecture. I won't give it to you. But I, it is really fascinating. And they use this for treatment of headache. And the way they would do it is they would take the fish and put it on your head. And, and in fact, it's like what we would call ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, because it is a big enough shock that <clears throat> that would happen. Um, uh, so, and it was treated with gout, uh, no effect, uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, an interesting first, that's the earliest I can find. Um, probably the most famous, and this is where in Western literature this all begins with, with Luigi Galvani. So Galvani is best known for the galvanic reaction, the galvanometers, and the discovery of electricity. And the history of this is really interesting. He had dissected a frog, and his assistant which had metal tools, right, um, noted that when they touched the neurons of the frog, which was in the spinal cord, right, the legs would retract abruptly. And we now do this 
as our basic introductory biology lab. We stimulate the neurons and get muscles to do their activity and look at that. I mean, this is an old experiment and it works every time. What he thought, the idea that humans and life forms had electrical um, content was certainly prevalent at the time. And what he thought was that the bodily electricity from his assistant was moving through the tools into the frog. That's what he thought was going on. It was a natural conclusion to me. But as it turns out, it was the wrong conclusion. Okay? Um, nonetheless, there was this notion at the time of galvanism. Life itself was electrical. And this is where this all begins. Okay? Um, Alessandro Volta. These are all the Italians. I don't know whether they were just having a shocking time in Italy. Um, they, um, he said, you know, uh, Galvani, yes, indeed. Uh, when you touch the metal tool to the neuron, there is an electrical signal, but it isn't being transmitted. It's the um, reaction of the salt solution with the metal that creates a small electrical potential that in turn was stimulating the neurons. And so he said, yes, uh, they do indeed have electrical activity, but it's being induced by a battery-like uh, activity of metal and salt solution. So it was really the uh, voltaic, voltaic interaction that was creating the voltage, hence the name Volta, right? Um, <clears throat> this idea of galvanism uh, became really entrenched in Western society. This was, this was the equivalent to then of like the information world today. Everybody was thinking about bioelectricity at the time. Guillaume Duchesne said, you know, not only can you get the muscles of dead things to twitch, because he noted that if you did this on an amputated arm, you can get the arm to do stuff, right? But he also noticed that if you do this to people while they're awake, you can get muscles to do all kinds of things. This is a very bizarre experiment. But I, I bring this up because this is actually, in my reading of the literature, this is probably the first diagnostic elect neural engineering tool developed. And that is with a known voltage across the muscles, he could measure a reaction. And he noted that in a class of individuals which had a disease where they couldn't move well, right, that their motion for the given signal was greatly suppressed. And this became known as Guillaume Duchesne's muscular dystrophy, or what we call Duchesne's muscular dystrophy. That he used electrical activity and direct stimulation, right, to quantify as a diagnostic tool a disease. I think it was the first that I can, that I can read. And even today we use uh, electrical stimulation, although now today we have genetic tools to screen for muscular dystrophy, but his was the first. And, and the disease is accordingly named by him at that time. Um, there's a very large literature about the interaction of the facial expression and assessment of psychological disorders. And they felt like if you could make somebody smile, like, <laughs> um, you could treat depression. Um, that didn't work, but it was an interesting idea. Uh, I just thought I'd put that out there. Uh, good. <clears throat> Not long after, it was clear that you could deliver electricity to living systems, right? That was clear. What was less clear is could you measure it? And could you measure the electrical activity of critical parts? That is the brain. And Hans Berger in 1924, um, this is a record of the first human electroencephalogram. And that was literally wires, silver wires, placed on the scalp in various locations and a recording of the wave-like activity of our brains. And Berger got 
not just the first recordings, but got very analytical about this. So those of you in sort of signal processing and electrical engineering will appreciate that Berger became deeply fascinated with the fact that the brain in various states has different dynamics, different waveforms. And um, so he started characterizing these as alpha waves and beta waves, different frequency domains. And even today, they're so reliable that we can use them in EEG with gaming technology and things like that, okay? Um, I, I, I left a slide out, but about the same time, about 1900, the fascination with electricity propagated into the popular literature of bioelectricity. And the most famous Western author on this is a woman named Mary Bith Shelley. And she wrote this short novel called Frankenstein. And Frankenstein was this creation of a dead body reanimated with electricity. And she had noted in the news and the literature that this was going on all the time. And in fact, that gave rise to a, a fear in society of electricity. That is, you could wake the dead. You could move them because that dead arm, um, that, that amputated arm that um, Duchesne studied was able to grasp, right? I mean, all he did is depolarize all these nerves, okay? Great. Neural engineering sort of took a side, and I, I bring this up because um, in the 30s, and I'm just trying to go by decade, in the 30s, um, a Russian mathematician developed a whole class of ideas called systems theory. Um, and that is the idea of what's called back afferentiation, which means that as I do a, an, uh, a, a motion and sense it, I also have a planning circuit that I initiate. And we became, as a society, very interested in the planning of the circuit. And he later gave rise to an entire area called cybernetics. That is the study of the motion of living things, particularly humans, and the planning that has to go into that motion, okay? And that's gonna become a critical part in this, in this mini course, is how do we pull out the planning circuit? What, what is it, if I wanna reach and grab something, how do I program that circuit? As it turns out, it's not a well-defined problem. I can grab something in a bunch of different ways of launching my motor programs, and individuals will vary in how they do that, okay? Um, Norbert Wiener um, really bring this, brought this area of cybernetics to, to uh, 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 an apex in the development, really, of control theory. And control theory is that domain in which we can formalize the inputs and the outputs and the transfer functions in even in very high dimensional space today. But back then it was fairly straightforward, although he also, his work has been used in Wiener kernel analysis, that is nonlinear signal analysis. We've been using it even within the last decade. So that was an extremely powerful thing. Um, you know, in the 60s up through the 90s, we see the development of lots and lots and lots of interactive technologies. I'll just give a few here. Um, the cochlear implant that is replacing neural stimulation in your inner ear with electrical activity began actually in the 1960s, was the first artificial hearing organ ever. And today, it's quite common, right? So that's the cochlear implant. Uh, at about the same time, people were working on something called sensory substitution. And there are a couple of these, but they use digital cameras. <laughs> this is even in the 60s. And they took the bit information and used it on an actuated system of pins to take a scene and digitize it onto your body. So if you can't see the world, could they use a video to stimulate a region so you could see, feel, hear that there's a door 
and a door and walls. So they would have a little actuated set of pins that you would wear on your stomach or your back. And actually, it turned out they built one that was not very popular. It was on your tongue. And it turns out your tongue is so sensitive to tiny motions that um, it, it worked, but it was very difficult to talk. <laughs> All right. Um, deep brain stimulation. I heard somebody mention this. I forgot who. Um, deep brain stimulation uh, really began in the 90s. Um, and um, let me just very quickly summarize what it is. It was discovered accidentally. This is not an engineered system. This is an accidental system that when you're doing surgery on patients who have neural disorders, you use a stimulating electrode to find out where in the brain you are. And the patient is mostly awake, okay? So that head's removed, the top is removed, and, you, and you'll see some graphic images shortly. Um, and you can put these electrodes in and you stimulate and the person will say, I taste chocolate. I move, they'll move their arm if you're in the motor cortex, if you're in the sensory cortex. But they were trying to identify a region of seizure activity in an individual who also had Parkinson's. And they were just stimulating and the Parkinson's tremor disappeared. Nothing, no design. This is not like, oh, I think if I stimulate in this particular region of the brain, I will remove the Parkinson's tremor. So just for a frame of reference, in Parkinson's, you have a disorder where you can't move and you're basically tremor, okay? And you can insert these electrodes and it's like a switch. The symptoms simply go away. Turn the stimulus off, oh, they come again, right? Just dramatic. Um, I'll talk to you later in the class about this. It is now possible to mine the data from your frontal cortex or from your motor cortex. And you can say, I am needing to stop my Parkinson's symptoms, and it simply closes the loop and does it. So you're listening in on neural signals to control a stimulation of your own brain. It's a little eerie. Uh, but doable. There are muscle controlled prosthesis. There is um, a vagus nerve stimulator, right, that can you know, suppress cardiac disease and all sorts of issues, okay? Um, we see now devices listening in on muscles that are running robotic arms. Uh, an implantable, as I'll talk about towards the end, retina. So this is the back of an eye, and this is a set of stimulating electrodes. The first FDA-approved retina was released last year, artificial retina. Um, a woman with a brain-computer interface controlling a robot, we'll see an example of this, um, feeding herself a chocolate bar, and she's completely paralyzed from the neck down, right? Um, and this is the uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulator there. All of these require um, engineering and neural systems. I can't do these as just an engineer. And, and, and the great thing is I'm looking out at people who are probably going to be both. I'm looking out at the next generation. You, because you're at this institution, will get a great engineering background and you'll do neuroscience. So you're likely to be the hybrid, which is great. Uh, let me just give you a couple current activities, and then we'll take a break till the afternoon session. So this is each two-hour lecture is going to be two hours, but close to. Okay. So <clears throat> let's uh, remind you of a couple things. We want to understand how neural systems function. We would like to replay, re repair or replace or assist with engineering tools. Okay. And we want to develop new insight, new inspiration for systems that will drive new technologies, running robotic hands, even freely flying devices. Um, we have a group of students that built a brain-computer interface to run a quad rotor. And you just think it through the room. It just, that, it's not great, <laughs> okay? But you'll see you can do this. And, you know, we could, uh, depending on how ambitious uh, a group we are, we could, you could use 
your arms and wireless technology to fly a little quad rotor just without just just by tensing and stuff all right I brought some of the technology with me I'm very ambitious it may not work okay before this afternoon's lecture where we're going to go into the detail here's the idea we plan our motion we sense our world up here once we've decided we're going to do something we send signals down our spinal cord via nerves that activate muscles that generate joint torques that accomplish task and behavior. That dynamic is felt and seen. So I cannot move around this room without knowing where my legs are and my arms and my body. I, my brain is constantly receiving closed loop sensory feedback. And my visual world is absolutely important as well. Okay? So um, what we'd like to do is, is do a couple examples. We're going to step in somewhere in here. So imagine, for example, there's somebody who had an automobile accident and they severed the spinal cord here. So they can't move. All they have is their brain, right? And there are a couple options. One option is I say, well, I'll just listen in on the brain and run a robot. That's one option. Another option is actually I'm going to listen in on the brain, process that information, run a robot, or you know what? I might build something like a jumper cable and come back and run muscles directly. Maybe I'll just run a jumper cable and come back into the spinal cord uh, past the region of the lesion, past that injury. Okay? So let's look at a couple examples. Uh, I'm not going to do all of these, but the first example will be um, this one. So, Let's imagine we have an individual who's paralyzed from the neck down, okay? And we want them to run a robot so that they can feed themselves, they can do things, and the like. The example I'm going to give you is using um, a robotic arm that was developed by Yoki Matsuoka. And this particular robotic arm was built to test certain hypotheses about actuation of a structure with tendons that are compliant. It's a hard controls problem because you're not directly activating by joint torques, which is something we know how to do in engineering. We're activating by pulling on elastic structures that indirectly create these highly nonlinear angle dependent joint torques. And the reason she did that is she's really interesting is how does our brain do that, right? How does our brain grab and manipulate? I can tell you right now, I went to a recent robotics conference, and I simply asked them, what do you think is your biggest robotics challenge? And they said it's something like this. Just grabbing something and manipulating it, which you have no problem doing this. You can do amazing manipulations. This is a hard robotics problem. Not only is it a hard robotics problem, but if it's not done with joint torques, and you have this very complicated nonlinear dynamical system, well, that's just fun. I can't do it, right? Great. So, how did he go about this? Um, my colleague, Jeff Ogeman, is a neurosurgeon. And Jeff, and along with our center, are interested in a whole bunch of neurologic disorders. And one of them, I'm going to tell you a story, is about identifying regions in your brain where seizure activity is happening. And it turns out, in a class of individuals, they can, the medication to suppress profound seizure disorder, that medication doesn't work. And the likely and preferred method is to surgically remove the seizure node of the brain. But you have to find it. So the way they look for a seizure node is the following. You take the top of the skull and you take it off. It's just like you know, open the hood of your car there's the engine, right? And then you lay a sheet of um, very compliant material directly on the brain, okay? And as we'll learn, you have to do this to get the spatial and temporal resolution you need. You can't go outside the skull yet. Although I will look to a machine learning person, I will look to signal analysis people and say one of the big challenges is getting the level of precision you can get deep inside the skull and hear that on the outside. That'd be great. Doesn't exist. 
So these are the electrodes. These are little metal tabs. I have a bunch here with me, all right? And, um, and if somebody wants to volunteer, I'm happy to take, no. I'll tell you about new technologies that are out there aren't quite so bad. So anyhow, the patient is in the hospital. They <clears throat> have the electrode array in, and you're there. And you can't say, okay, now I'm going to have a seizure. You simply wait. And they're somewhat medicated because it's not exactly comfortable. And um, they put the head together uh, during this two-week period. But in that interval of time, data are streaming off of 128 electrodes at 40 kilohertz per electrode for weeks. This is a big data problem, okay? And my postdoc, um, Bing Brunton, and her colleague Lee did some data mining on this. The patient's in the hospital, and you can ask them for permission to say, I would <clears throat> like to do some experiments. Would you um, just think about grabbing something? Just think about it. The patient goes, okay, and you have to sign all sorts of release forms. But they're already in the hospital. We already have data coming from them. We we'll simply go in and ask them to please think about really grabbing something. And so I'm going to ask all of you not to do this, not to actually grab with your arm, but everybody think about doing that motion. Just think about it. Ah, excellent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. As you think about it, the part of your brain that plans the motion actually carries out the instruction set. You just didn't launch the motion. In order for you to grab, you first have to plan. And so we went to the planning region of the brain for grab, okay? And you're listening in. In this case, the patient's nose is this way, okay? The back of the head is here. And the planning region is right here. Uh, for the left hand, it's here. And for the right hand, it's there, okay? And you listen in on this array of electrodes. And unfortunately, the sound isn't working, but this patient is here. And uh, obviously, let's see if I can get this to play. Um, and pinch. And relax. And pinch. And relax. Try again. Now you can grab the little ball. What's neat is the robot arm was in the computer science department with a video camera, and this patient was in the hospital about a half a mile away. Marvels of the internet, okay? So I don't want to make this seem trivial. Um, there's a lot of work that went into this, not just the robotic side, but it's a big machine learning problem of listening over and over and over again to that planning region until you are sure you've got a reasonable signal. Then, as an engineer, you use that signal in a controller, in a robot, so that it would do a motion of choice, right? But it did take training. And what was stunning was very little. The, the patient just had to think about it. They didn't need a lot of feedback, right? And it turns out you can put that on any region of the brain. It could be your toe, your knee, your tongue. It will all, you will learn. That's the marvelous thing about us. You can use almost any part of your brain to accomplish tasks. Um, I'm going to go on to another example. But there's a case <clears throat> in which a monkey uh, was taught, well, it was, had a brain-computer interface, not too different, um, with a hole drilled, and this is uh, something that our, our lab helped develop. It's called NeuroChip, a chip that you pop in, and it listens into a subset of categories uh, of neurons. And the monkey was trained to run a robotic arm to feed it a banana. And the way you do it, you place the monkey uh, in, a, in a device, and it has the robot in front of it, and it, you know, it learns. It's given treats, and the arm that it would normally do this with, it just couldn't use. It just strapped it, and then it perfectly happily fed itself little bits of banana. What I found very interesting is they let the monkey have use of both its arm and the robot arm. 
What do you think happened? Anybody? What would you do? Yeah, go ahead. You know, got three arms all of a sudden. And sure enough, the monkey kept feeding itself and you know, just doing monkey stuff with its other arms and said, yeah, I can do this. It grew another arm. As I told you, brains are very dynamic. I thought you would like that. Um, yeah. Like in this experiment, I mean, like, did they ever try like uh, architecture that wasn't just a hand? Like, what if they put like another finger or? So um, this, is, this is a great, great idea. That hand turns out to be a challenging one. Um, there are, but but today um, you can buy something called the shadow hand. It's it's a off-the-shelf, uh, research-grade, um, highly articulated joint torque base hand that's very easy to work with. And shadow hand has been used to do all of these big, what we call robot challenges of controlling devices and stuff like that, turning tools and things. And so they're using now shadow hand with brain-computer interface. That's one. And then there are other things, very simple robotics, like quad rotors or things that are just not hands. You can, um, well, I, you know, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get into this. this is, I'm trying to do the whole course in one day. That's bad. But you can um, use brain signals to do all kinds of things. I'm going to give an example on Monday's lecture, but I'll talk a little about it today, of, um, of using brain-controlled interface to do gaming. And that was done for a therapy method. Okay, So these are things that are out there. So you could, you know, basically your question is, I'll just say yes, you could do anything. Frankly, the simpler the robot is, the easier the training and the paradigm, right? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to listen to brain signal from outside because there is some surgery technique? Yeah, okay. So he's saying this <laughs> seems invasive. <laughs> is it possible to listen on the outside? So let me tell you two things that are going on. Uh, one is... Um, this is a diagnostic tool. So it's used to identify seizure. That's actually since that, that was 2011, 2010, somewhere in there that we were working on this. Since then, um, there's been the de development of new technologies for electrode arrays that, um, um, this is an engineering problem. They're strips of very flexible, uh, polyimid, but rigid enough that you can just drill a small hole, just a half a centimeter in diameter, so five millimeters, and you feed a strip in this way, like that, and this way, like that, just through one hole, right? And that's not as invasive, um, and that's being used um, uh, by a group in Australia right now, somebody who came out of our group, uh, Jadeep Mavuri. And these are now, and they put a seal over it, have transcranial power, okay? Just like the cochlear implant has transcranial power. That works, and people are walking around with electrodes permanently implanted, and they built a seizure detecting algorithm using machine learning, saying, you know, are you about to have a seizure? We can't stop it, but you can get yourself to a safe place because we think you're about to, right? That's great use of software and hardware. And then you ask, well, how about just on the outside? And, and you know, it turns out that that's a hard problem um, because the signal clarity through the layers, um, there's uh, several soft tissue layers above the cortex. The arachnoid and the dura are the dominant ones. Then there's skull, and then there's skin, right? And that's a lot of signal degradation. And one of the challenges is how much can you pull out given that it's a bad signal? And the other challenge is as you move around, your neck muscles, your, all these supporting muscles generate huge signals relative to brain signals. And that's a hard data mining problem as well. But that's an open problem. So having people listening in on your neck and shoulders at the same time here so you can get reduct you can smartly remove the contaminating muscle signals right 
This is a great question, but that's an open problem, and people are worried about it. Yeah. And currently, I think the, the emotive comedy yep. the Yeah, we have the emotive headsets, and they're so how accurate? Not. <laughs> they don't. They, that's the one where you, all your body muscles really get. In the way. I'm sorry, if, if somebody owns stock in Emotive, they're doing really well, but I would, you know, I was going to bring the Emotive headset with me. It's just it's a one you can just get. Um, they don't work very well. Uh, so don't recommend. I, you know, for games, to totally fine, but for gaming, I can do it with two electrodes. One here and one in the back. And, and the reason is um, most of what you can do is uh, we'll talk about this, it's called the P300. There's a particular frequency of excitation of your brain that is a consequence of startle. And then there, that's one thing, so you get that. And then the two give you um, sort of the rich band of Fourier transform. You can get rich Fourier transforms out of this. And when you are relaxed mentally, your brain signals are like this. Very nice, slow waves. When you're about to fall asleep, it's very slow frequency. Um, and when you're really concentrating, that slow frequency is gone. You have very low amplitude, high frequency activity. And so you can use just frequency separation to play games. And that's what emotive does. You can use lots of electrodes, but they really only listen. <laughs> to it just looks good. Uh, this is a great question. I saw another hand up somewhere. Uh, Okay, I'll just keep going. This is great. Um, <clears throat> let me give you uh, another example here of the one I just talked about <clears throat> that is going straight to muscle. So skipping the nerve. So this one went from head to robot. Now let's go back into this device. And the reason this is so interesting is that we can stimulate muscle directly, as you saw from Duchesne. What Duchesne did is, you know, big currents coming into it, but they weren't guided by your brain. I'm going to talk a little about what my past student, Chet Moritz, did. Okay. Chet is now in the faculty at the University of Washington. He has an interesting background. Uh, just started out as an insect muscle physiology in my lab many years ago and kept moving his technology into more and more advanced systems from rat to monkey, and now he works almost strictly in human, okay? Um, <clears throat> here's what they did, and we're going to talk more about this later. This is a monkey experiment where they're asking a monkey to do a task, and the task is to take a red cursor and move it into the black box, okay? That's all. And monkeys easily trained to do this with their arm using a little um, joystick. And they're, they're in um, a little chair, and they have the little joystick, and there's a little thing that squirts tasty monkey juice. Um, so every time they win, they get monkey juice, and that's how they do it. It's like it's a mixture of banana and orange juice, and they just love it, right? And, you know, they get really, really good at this game, okay? And so that's great. Now we put in a nerve block. You're not cutting the nerve. You're just actually pharmacologically blocking all the nerves from here on. And you, then what you do is you put an array, or, <laughs> sorry, you put some electrodes in the brain. And this is using Neurochip, a little thing we built. And we actually built it for insects, but it works. Muscle is muscle, brain is brain, bugs, humans, I don't care, right? They all signal, what right? Uh, we used very large ones. It was called Manduka. It was a large hawk moth, but it has a big accessible brain. Um, and Neurochip drove the production of ultra-tiny <laughs> chip technology, which was advantageous for small insects because they can't carry an oscilloscope. And um, so this worked. All right, <clears throat> they're listening in. And by mechanisms you're going to learn about, you're able to listen in with several electrodes and identify individual cells firing. All right? There's a and fun mathematical thing we'll talk about later of how do you take several electrodes in the brain and tell me individual units, one neuron from another, okay? 
It's called spike sorting. We'll talk about it. It's a fun math problem, right? And they, they were able to sort to a single spike train, right? So these are the times in which that neuron is firing, right? One cell, right? And this is in real time. And they measure the rate at which that neuron is firing, okay? So this is the rate or one over the time between successive firings, okay? It's called the interspike interval. That's the rate. It's very high here, low, high, super high, whatever. And then they do a discriminator on this and say when the rate exceeds a certain value, stimulate the muscle to do that, right? And just do that. It makes it move left, right? So they're using a direct, what's called functional electrical stimulation, stimulating the muscle directly, like that. So they listen in on the brain on one cell. This is the most important thing. One neuron. Not the whole brain. Not the motor planning section. One cell. And they discriminate. And the monkey learns to feed itself by using that one cell. Okay? What got, so uh, there's some details on this. Uh, you had to build really good what are called multi-site electrodes. This is one set um, that was fabricated commercially. And we actually had a group we did with a classmate of Eming from when you were at MIT with Joel Voldman. Uh, we built these things that go around nerve cuffs. These are multi-site arrays that you can just slide around a whole nerve, right? And listen in on many sites and extract out single units, okay? So you did need the technology, yeah. Yeah, you don't. Um, so um, the trick is you're, it, it could be doing a whole program, and you're just listening in on to one cell that happens to correlate with that. Um, but um, what was done since this paper, and that was 2008, is they realized that you're listening in to many cells at once, and they asked the question, could I get the cursor, monk, first of all, could I get a monkey to run the cursor in the vertical and horizontal direction? So they had to build um, a wrist-based device, like a joystick. It's still keeping the arm um, Velcro to a little arm rest, arm rest. Could they get the monkey to control the cursor in two directions? And then could they discriminate two different neurons to do that? And the answer is yes. That, that got to your point, and, and yes, they can do that. But still then, it's two cells, one cell for left, right, and to be candid, it was one cell for right, and the tendency, if you don't fire, was to go the other way, right, of the simu simulation, and one cell for up, and it otherwise drifts down, right? So just to be very clear. So then, it needs to, you have to put the cursor in different spots, and it has this task of having to get it into that, by that mechanism, gives you an idea of the challenge, but they do it. You know, frankly, I, in my lab, I won't do monkey research, not because I don't want to work on monkeys, it's just it takes so long to train them. Um, no, seriously, it's a, very, it's a very serious investment of time. So I sit on a graduate student committee of uh, several who do monkey brain computer interface, and they have one monkey, right? It's very expensive, very extensive personal training time that you do to get them to do the task that you can then analyze and work with. So I, I think it's very fascinating, but you don't necessarily need monkeys to do these challenging things. Okay, yeah? Uh, how's, how's the dimension of the electrical? Uh, uh, No, no, yeah, you don't. You just need to, you know, I'm sorry, they're much bigger. The spacing is much wider than a single cell. What you're doing, and we'll talk about this, um, I can't remember which lecture is, but you're, basically, if all of you were talking in this room, and I have a couple of ears around here, I can use all of your voices and separate you by your, your characteristic voice. 
So what, you, what we're doing is called local field potential spike separation. So it's fun math, but if you, if you all of a sudden were going ping, 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 and I had everybody in the room doing it, and I had a set of microphones listening in, the likelihood that two of you ping at exactly the same time and have exactly the same shape of the ping um, spectrogram is very low. And so that what you're using is temporal coincidence and shape characteristics to pull out these units, and that's called spike sorting. So the electrode array has to be big enough to sample the units and small enough to not sample so many that you're not hearing the relevant ones. That's a great question. Uh, I, ICA? Yeah, I, ICA is one of the methods used, um, independent contrast analysis. There's also PLS, projection onto latent structures. Um, you, there's, you can just use sort of brute force, machine learning. Um, there are a lot of ways of doing this. Um, and um, can I ask one more, sorry, how many of you do MATLAB? Everybody, half, C, Python? Okay, not 100% not MATLAB. Um, so Python and MATLAB, you can now just, MATLAB has downloadable spike sorting. You just get it and it <laughs> works really well. And Python has one now too. So if you find yourself uh, acquiring neural data of this sort, you, you know it's free to analyze it, okay? It's just like MATLAB has downloadable particle Im image velocimetry and you know, just get ever. I, I don't guarantee them because they're done by uncontrolled participants. Ah, here's the details of this. This is the spike frequency uh, of that. Here's the torque uh, production. Those are the units firing there. It's a little more detailed. Um, one of you, uh, we were asking about the transcranial recording of electrical activity. This is not the emotive headset. This is, um, oh, I've forgotten the name now. This is a better one because it's elastically tight on your head. The contacts remain pretty stable, still suffers from other muscle activity. But what you can do is you can separate out the frequency components in time of different activities. So this is the underlying frequency components of the electrical activity of many units in time. And you can actually do some regionalization of the brain of where these are going on, right? So this array over here is picking up certain frequency bands. This array over here are different ones, right? And you can basically train machines or learn to build models based on the data. So for example, if I had a person sitting there and I'm having them play a video game, right? And every time they hit their thumb, right, I mine the data for the thumb hit, okay? And, and you could do that pretty well. It has to be pretty clear. So it has to be about the only thing you're doing to get it from, from through the skull, okay? Um, let me just take this one extra step and I, I think I'm nearly done. Um, this will be a little odd. Um, you can do a couple things. Um, can you actually take the brain signals from Karen and put a cap on her and then um, take, what's your name? Alec. Alec and he's in another room, and I'm gonna use a device. It's not safe, but it works. The device is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. And it's a big set of coils. And they put a big magnetic field right over your skull, and it causes depolarization of a region of your brain. Uh, and it's been around since the 1980s, okay, TMS. I see you're wincing, you know about it, right? My colleague did the following experiment. You listen in on Raj Rao's brain, okay? Raj is my colleague. He's a computational neuroscience. He's the one that does the algorithm. And you extract data mining in the high frequency band associated with the thumb playing a game, right? And then his buddy, through the internet, gets transcranial magnetic stimulation. Here are the coils. 
There's a field that drives down. This is Andreas, right? This is Raj, okay? And Raj is playing a game, right? Here he's playing a computer game. And this is Andreas' thumb playing Raj's commands on a different computer. I wouldn't recommend doing this. Uh, if they had asked me in advance, I would have said, you're giving Andreas a very, very high chance of having seizure. Just saying. But they did. Uh, and it hit the news and it was very popular. And I don't know to what end, but they said others were going to do it, so they wanted to get out first. Okay. This is an example of neuroengineering. And, I, and, I, and now I've gone on almost till noon. I think that's enough for this morning session. Um, I know there's a lunch break, and we reconvene at 2. Is that correct? 2. Two, two. So um, let me, before I let you go, let me just get a show of hands. Um, the afternoon lecture is about basic neuroscience. That is, I'm going to go over regions of the brain, structure of the nervous system. Is this something that will be useful to you as, because I think it's very hard for me to do much more without some background in neuroscience, okay? Then tomorrow, we'll go back in the morning and do a little more at the cellular and protein level. And then in the afternoon, we'll do some computational neuroscience. Does that sound good? Excellent. Then we'll meet again at 2. Uh, I'm happy to be, I'll be around for questions and the like. Great. Session 1 is done. Uh, there'll be an exam this afternoon. No, I, just, I can't do that to you. Great. You're a good group.